Hello everybody, it's Wayne Jones, the course coordinator for statutory interpretation. That's laws 11059 at Central Queensland University. Just let's have a look at the first chapter in uh, the textbook, Statutory Interpretation by Michelle Sanson. That's the textbook we'll be working through for this term. And I'm working from the second edition. Um, before you take the introductory chapter lightly, let me tell you that there are some very fundamental concepts that need to be pointed out to you. And I, just a couple of concepts I really think that you need to think about as you start with the interpretation course. One of the first of the concepts is this issue that uh, it's becoming much more important to be thinking about statutory interpretation all the time. You're learning from your introduction course that uh, the law comes from the common law, of course, the judge-made law, and there's also uh, legislation. But I think the um, textbook author makes the point uh, quite strongly at the outset that there is uh, a lot more law being made through uh, legislation than there is by case law. And the common law very much these days seems to be uh, preoccupied with the interpretation of legislation rather than making new law. Now, of course, there'll be exceptions to that in particular areas where the common law is strong. But as a general rule, cases which are going to court are more often than not about the interpretation of um, a new piece of legislation or some words or phrases in a legislation. So increasing in importance all the time. Just a comment that I'd make um, early in the piece about why we do this. Um, can I make it absolutely plain that this is what lawyers are expected to do for their clients? We are expected to presume that there will be um, interpretations of legislation that will be favourable to our clients. And you'll see lots of examples in the textbook as we move forward, so I won't make up anything now. But it's an essential part of what we do uh, that we um, first of all look at legislation and forewarn our clients uh, as to whether or not the legislation might apply to them and secondly if they do fall foul of the law we're generally looking for a reason that the particular piece of legislation perhaps doesn't apply to our client or doesn't apply to the full extent that the legislation might appear to at the first glance so it's what we do when we uh, as lawyers um, embark on statutory interpretation as a day-to-day -day task. You'll see there in the textbook the reference to the fact that it's very much a function of what judges do, but can I also make the argument that it's also a very much a, a function of what uh, lawyers do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And by the way, I love the comment that we are allowed to do this. If you like, we're almost given permission to do it because um, uh, the the task, this complex task of statutory interpretation, more often involves an art form rather than a science. So I thought that was a very good um, a very good point that the textbook author made. Um, note the uh, the comments regarding um, the uh, role of the separation of powers when you're thinking about statutory interpretation. We'll we'll come back and touch on this. Um, again and again, but just a quick reminder: uh, the the, uh, the the government power, uh, or the, the the power of the the state, if you like, is divided between the legislature that makes the law, the administrative arm of government, um, the, the the government departments, the uh, the ministries, etc., that uh, that administer the law on a day-to-day -day basis, and the judiciary, of course, which interprets the law. And remember, the, statute, the, the uh, separation of powers document suggests that whilst uh, courts, judges may interpret statutes, they're not supposed to cross over that line and start making new law. And uh, the authors make the comment that a court can't improve or rewrite or develop a statute. So that's, that's a, a point which is very important to make early in the piece. So, so think about that as we're looking at interpretation. Think about it particularly as we progress through the book and you find a case that you're up in arms about and you think, well, how could that possibly happen? Uh, that just doesn't seem just or fair. And the answer is going to be uh, often in part because the legislation's been given a very literal interpretation. 
the the judges um, have been very much in favour of the idea of the separation of powers and have said, well, well we can work out what Parliament intended, but we certainly can't um, try to amend it or make it more fair. That's not our role, it's not our job. The, um, the whole issue around interpretation or construction, um, interesting point, and coming back to what I said to you before about it is our role to do this, um, what allows us to be able to do it is that often a piece of legislation which looks on its face uh, to be quite black and white is either in, uh, unclear, so in other words, uh, the, the meaning of, of, of the words as they're used is not terribly clear, um, it might be incomplete, and you will read a couple of cases as we move through the text um, about situations which just weren't contemplated by the, uh, by the Parliament when the law was made, uh, perhaps uh, the world's changed a little bit, or perhaps it was just a set of circumstances that the Parliament hadn't thought about. So in that case, the legislation will be um, incomplete. And then sometimes, particularly when the judges are talking about construction, they're talking about looking at the meaning of the whole section, or perhaps even thinking in, in broader terms about the meaning of the, the, the whole Act, um, uh, from a constructive point of view, what's what's this act really about? Why why has it even been enacted? And that'll give them some hints as to why a particular section or sentence or paragraph should be interpreted in a particular way. So sometimes it's about construction, thinking um, fr from a from a much higher point of view, a much higher perspective. Um, what's the overall intent and purpose? Sometimes. Uh, it's about interpretation, and that is down to the word level. What's that particular word mean? Um, I like the comments that are made about history and hierarchy because they do give you a feel for what's gone before. Specifically, um, they remind us that um, originally all of the law came from the judges. Well, all of the law came from the king, I suppose, initially, but then was judge-made. So the, the, the judges were making the law and their decisions were being written down. And then as Parliament came to the ascendancy and started to make statute law, um, it was accepted that the statute law made by the whole of the Parliament had to be followed. And so it was almost a push back from, from the judges, from the common law courts to say, well, OK, we'll do it, but we will do it on a very narrow basis. Um, and interesting point in the textbook about, well, what's the approach then of the Australian courts uh, been um, since uh, since Federation? And the answer was, well, pretty much until recent times, highly conservative, fairly literal and focused on the black and white meaning of the, of the act itself. So um, you need to take that and you need to bear that in mind. Cases from the beginning of the 20th century, for example, cases like the Engineers case, etc., uh, where they're very much focused on the literal meaning of the world of the words, so they're very conservative. And then, as you move forward into the uh, 1980s and the 1990s and beyond, you're going to come across other cases where a very different approach is uh, is taken. And um, there is a, there was a, a, um, a theory put forward by Pound, um, four options for the treatment of legislation. Um, have a look at that in the text. Um, have a look also that uh, the, the authors suggest that it's only the last one, the uh, direct effect of the statutes applying a strict or a very narrow interpretation is where we're coming from. And somewhere up above there in one of those other alternatives is perhaps where we are today or perhaps another approach somewhere up above there is uh, is where we might be on a particular uh, day or, or we might be there based on um, which particular judge we're talking about. It can be as simple as that. So um, anyway, that brings me to my next point, which was uh, to, uh, to introduce you to the concept that there is a spectrum of judicial, appoint, uh, of judicial uh, approach. And I've got there in the slides a a uh, copy of Justice uh, Kirby, uh, Michael Kirby as he was, who's described in the text as the great dissenter. But um, it was also a, a judge who didn't necessarily take the formalist approach um, and was uh, willing to, um, to, for example, uh, to think about the, 
the long-term effect of, of a particular interpretation. Uh, look, in any event, uh, I make the point, as do the authors, that um, there, is a, there is a conflict between legal formalism and judicial activism. So if we assume that Justice Kirby was a, ju a judicial activist, then uh, the opposite would be a legal formalist, and that is somebody who really felt strongly about this, this idea of the separation of powers and argued strongly that, well, look, the law might be bad or its application might uh, lead to an unfair result, but uh, we can't do anything about that because uh, we're not in a position to change the law. Justice Kirby, uh, of course, um, is from time to time quite willing to, where it's possible, use the statutory presumptions that we'll talk about later in the textbook around uh, liberty and, uh, and, and around fundamental human rights to say, well, the law probably or, or really shouldn't mean whatever it appears to mean, and surely, that, uh, surely that's not what the judges meant when they used that form of words. But a legal formalist will say, can't do that, all very well to think about whether it's a fair result or not, but that's not our role. The Constitution tells us we simply interpret what the law is. Um, and uh, in favour in favour of those legal formalists, note the arguments too that, uh, on the one hand, the public want to have confidence that justice will be done, but then on the other hand, it's really unfair uh, to say to a litigant, well, look, it'll depend on who we get, we get on the bench on the particular day as to whether we get a legal formalist or whether we get a judicial activist. Uh, it's just going to be the luck of the draw. The law also uh, is well served by there being uh, consistency. So, look, lots of arguments for you to think about as to, as to which uh, view you favour, but don't write off legal formalist straight away until you think about some of those um, arguments. What do the judges actually do? Now, this is an important point that's made early in the text as well, and I'm, and I'm just re remind you, I'm raising these things um, in the introduction so that I can take you back to them later on when we talk um, about specific examples of, of where this uh, happens. So what do judges do? Well, I like the comment um, that it's very much a reiterative uh, process. So you might look at the provision, uh, you consider it in light of the remainder of the statute, you come back to it, um, you get a clearer understanding. It might be different to the original understanding when you read the black and white uh, letter of the law. So in other words, this almost like a circular uh, discussion where you try on various uh, rules that you'll that we'll we'll see over the next 12 weeks together, try them on and keep coming back to see whether you're closer to having an understanding of uh, of the of the purpose of the uh, of the legislation and, and then consequently the meaning of the legislation. Um, so that's that's one uh, version. Also, there was a suggestion in the introductory chapter about um, a model where there might be three key phases. So, for example, you might, first of all, identify um, what's the legislation that's uh, applicable. Is there um, any legislation that is, is being applied here? Um, and if a certain piece of legislation is being suggested as applying to your client's facts and circumstances, check first and foremost that it was actually in force at the relevant time and in the relevant place. So did it apply in your state and was it in force at the time? Uh, then the uh, authors suggest an exploration phase where you might think about things like uh, the statute as a whole, um, any extrinsic material, and we'll talk about those in the next couple of weeks, but specifically things like were the uh, did the Parliament issue any explanatory uh, memorandum when it introduced the, the law? And then once you've got that, come back to the application phase where you return to the statute book again, open it up again in a new light, now that you know a bit about its context, its purpose, what, was, what did the explanatory memo say, and then start working towards uh, a legal meaning. So like a three-step phase there, quite interesting. Um, we talked about formalism or, or activism, and certainly, um, as I said to you before, I, I would argue with you to, uh, to think carefully about legal formalism and, and what some of the, um, the important aspects of, of uh, formalism are before you rush headlong in favour of um, 
uh, of Justice Kirby, but certainly uh, there's some good arguments as to why um, uh, formalism uh, is a preferred approach for, for some justices, and certainly there are very good arguments around judicial activism as well. And then look, finally, for my comments, uh, just with respect to the first chapter, uh, do note the comments that are made with respect to precedent. So some of you who have already got a couple of subjects under your belt might very well say, look, there have been plenty of cases on the interpretation of, uh, of, of laws. Um, how come there's not a, a steady or steadily building body of uh, precedent around how legislation is, a particular piece of legislation is meant to be interpreted? And uh, the answer is a, is a slightly curious one. It, the answer is that um, for some, for example, some national scheme legislation, and the one that I'm thinking of is workplace health and safety, where, uh, where a, a particular piece of legislation is mirrored from state to state to state, uh, judges do tend to, to try and keep some consistency. So you won't have um, one interpretation of what a workplace is in New South Wales and then a very different one in Queensland. They'll keep an eye on each, on the, on each other on, and on the development of that national scheme legislation. But having said that, um, you couldn't then look at a completely different piece of legislation. So using that example again about a workplace, that might be okay in the national scheme that relates to workplace health and safety. But if you were talking about uh, an, another piece of legislation unrelated, say um, legislation that dealt with pay and conditions, uh, you couldn't necessarily apply the same cases that had been used to interpret the law in one piece of legislation, or more to the point, to interpret a word in one piece of legislation and say with great certainty, well, look, that was how it was applied. That was how workplace uh, was, was defined by the courts in the Workplace Health and Safety Act. Therefore, uh, when a court has a look at the words workplace in the uh, Fair Work Act, they'll have, to apply the same, um, they'll have to apply the same meaning because that's how uh, precedent works. That's not the case. And the reason will become more obvious as we progress through the 12 weeks. I guess one of the main reasons, though, is every act needs to be looked at individually because every act will have its own context. So the context in which the words are used in that act might be quite different to the context in which they're used um, in, in, uh, in an earlier piece of legislation. So a bit tricky. Um, there are rules, though. I mean, there are, there are uh, you will see that there are precedents in, st in general statutory interpretation rules about a number of things, but you can't, just to make that point again, you can't assume that because there's been a case on the interpretation of a word in one act, that it's going to be applied strictly in another act. Um, look, overall, can I ask you also, just in finishing on chapter one, note the comments from the textbook author that there is, in fact, a flow diagram in the back of the book, and there's also a quick reference list of rules of statutory interpretation in the back, in the back of the book as well. Um, really important because there is in fact a process. Now it's not the sort of process that's mechanical and that you could do on a calculator, but there are different phases and there are a number of uh, suggestions as we proceed through the book about the different phases that might apply. But the point is to understand that there are a number of different rules which can be applied at different times. And uh, I really think that it would be worth your while from time to time. Keep jumping ahead to the flow diagrams and to the quick reference at the back of the book. Uh, and just to refresh your memory about uh, rules that you've read in chapters as we proceed. They're my comments in relation to the introductory uh, chapter. I hope that's uh, useful. And uh, next week um, we'll have a, a talk about the creation of legislation.